On this Tuesday night, Roseanne Archibald on the record. I am suspended because I am speaking the truth. The Assembly of First Nations National Chief alleging misspent money. There's lots in the AFN that's hidden. At her claims of sexism, new accusations and resignations in Britain's government, the crisis after two key cabinet ministers quit, the trail of evidence left by the man accused in a killing spree at this parade. We do believe Cremo pre-planned this attack for several weeks. And new details about the victims. Plus, powering forward. Hopefully it opens the door to to give other opportunities to other minorities. The NHL's new historic hire. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Colleen Christie. Good evening, thanks for joining us. The Assembly of First Nations annual general meeting is underway in Vancouver. The session aims to set goals for the upcoming year and reach resolutions on critical issues, but the official agenda has been overtaken by infighting over the future of its national chief, Roseanne Archibald. Nitu Garcha is at the meeting tonight, and Nitu, you have some breaking news. I do, Colleen. After debating the resolution, AFN membership have voted to stop the temporary suspension of National Chief Roseanne Archibald. This comes after she was removed from the agenda multiple times and added back on at the last minute and was finally able to address the assembly earlier today. We heard today that everybody wants to move on from this issue and onto critical issues on their agenda for later in the week, including Indigenous child welfare and climate change. I know Kenny went through a lot. Entangled in controversy, the elected national chief making an unconventional entrance to the Vancouver Convention Centre for the annual meetings of the Assembly of First Nations. They erased me from the agenda. Now they put me back on. And so what I want you to know is all of these actions are because they want to silence me. With supporters of all ages, Roseanne Archibald walking in and claiming the crisis now gripping the organization started when she rejected a million dollar staff payout, which she says revealed bigger problems. It's a real misuse of funds that the AFN has been doing for years. There have been millions of dollars in payouts at the AFN and that's why we need this forensic audit to show all of these payouts and how they have been misusing these funds. After an investigation into bullying and harassment claims concluded last month and Archibald disclosed what the AFN executive has called confidential information, they suspended her with pay and called the allegations of corruption unfounded. People are torn, especially the women chiefs. They are torn with these events. A fair workplace investigation process, which the national chief's words and actions have made nearly impossible. But Archibald's lawyer says whistleblower policy is clear in the charter and the AFN committee never had the ability to suspend her. This suspension is unlawful. I do have a path out of this. We need to establish a new corporation based in our culture and values. I only exist because all of you put me in this position. So an attack on me is an attack on you. An alleged culture of backroom deals now front and center as the assembly with more than 400 in attendance is urged to take back the week's meetings from the AFN executive. Okay, Nitu, what happens next? Well, Colleen, it was decided that first thing on Wednesday, two other resolutions will be voted on. One of those is a non-confidence motion, motion which would oust National Chief. The other is to commence a forensic audit spanning the last eight years of spending within the AFN, as well as an internal investigation into workplace toxicity. Before they move on to any of the other issues on their agenda for the rest of the week, it is said that those resolutions will be voted on. But, Colleen, there is such a deep divide within the AFN right now, some calling this moment a coup against the first woman national chief of the AFN, while the executive is saying that she disclosed confidential information, and unlawfully so, and that is why we're at the place we are now. Colleen? Interesting. Nitu Garcha in Vancouver. Thanks, Nitu. 
Britain's Prime Minister Boris Johnson is clinging to his job tonight after two of his most senior ministers resigned from cabinet. The health secretary and chancellor or finance secretary say they've lost confidence in Johnson after another embarrassing scandal played out over the past few days. Our Redmond Shannon joins us from London and Redmond bring us up to date on how these resignations happened. Well, Colleen, it began with another resignation last week. The Deputy Chief Whip Chris Pincher of the ruling Conservative Party stood down after he was alleged to have groped two men at a party. Then it emerged there were previous misconduct allegations against him. It was alleged Boris Johnson knew about them when he appointed Pincher as Deputy Whip. At first, the Prime Minister's office said Johnson was not aware of the allegations. Then they said he didn't know about specific allegations. Then they said he did know but forgot. This evening, Johnson went on TV to apologise and to admit that he had been told. But I'm giving you uh, the absolute truth as, as far as I can remember about what happened. Uh, can with, people trust you? Well, of course they can. And I'm, t I'm telling After you. After all this? I'm telling you exactly what happened. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming out to, uh, to explain it because I'm, I'm, I'm fed up with people, if I may say so, Chris, saying things on my uh, behalf or well, trying to say people trying, to, trying to say things about what uh, I knew or didn't know and I'm trying to explain to you uh, exactly what happened as I remember it. And Colleen just as that interview was being aired two senior ministers the health secretary and the chancellor of the exchequer or the finance minister here tweeted out their resignation letters. Sajid Javid and Rishi Sunak are both believed to have aspirations for the top job. Redmond what happens next for Boris Johnson? Well, Colleen, just last month, Johnson survived a Tory no-confidence vote with 59% of his MPs supporting him. That was in the wake of the revelations about the gatherings that took place in Downing Street and government offices, breaking pandemic lockdown rules. Johnson and Sunak both received police fines as part of that. The Conservative Party rules say they can't challenge Boris Johnson again for a year, but members can change those rules. And with the Tories lagging behind in the polls, many of Johnson's MPs may think the only way they can keep their jobs at the next election is if the Prime Minister is removed. Colleen? Redmond Shannon in London. Thanks, Redmond. Officials in Illinois say a seventh person has now died after the attack on a July 4th parade near Chicago as disturbing new details emerge tonight. The suspect, Robert E. Cremo III, has been charged with seven counts of first-degree murder. Police say he planned the massacre for weeks and dressed in women's clothing so he could blend with the crowd during his escape. As Jackson Prosco reports, before the attack, the accused gunman amassed a small arsenal of weapons all legally obtained. The horror that unfolded on the 4th of July was meticulously planned weeks in advance. Police say the gunman shot a high-powered rifle at random into the crowd from a rooftop overlooking the parade route. After firing more than 70 shots, investigators say he tried to blend into the panicked crowd. During the attack, Primo was dressed in woman's clothing, and investigators do believe he did this to conceal his facial tattoos and his identity and help him during the escape. At street level, witnesses described terror. After surviving the massacre, several doctors watching the parade rushed to help the victims. You saw massive amounts of blood in the people that were gone. Their injuries were horrific. I've had deaths on the table. I've had, you know, I've, I've seen, I've seen death, and at least I, I, un I can understand that. I know why it happened, um, but, but here I can't understand just the senseless taking of a life. The dead and wounded range from ages eight to 85. Victims like Nicholas Toledo, a grandfather visiting family, and Jackie Sundheim, who worked at a local synagogue. The suspect, 21-year-old Robert Cremo III, was arrested by police late Monday. Investigators still don't have a motive, but they're focusing on the suspect's online posts, including dozens of violent images and cartoons that showed an interest in mass murder. We need to have a very real national conversation about why we're okay with allowing weapons of war on our streets. Like so many of America's recent mass killings, this one involved guns that were legally purchased. A nation that's inundated with as many as 400 million personally owned firearms, I think we can safely say this will continue to happen until something different 
uh, occurs. It's pretty dramatic. And like so many American communities, the town of Highland Park is now forever changed by a senseless act that claimed innocent lives. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Russian forces are stepping up attacks on Ukraine's two eastern provinces. In the aftermath of Ukraine's strategic pullout from Lysychansk, Russia is now focusing on driving Ukrainian forces out of the eastern Luhansk and Donetsk regions. Heavy Russian artillery and rocket strikes are hitting not only the remaining military targets in the region, but also homes and civilian facilities like this school in Kharkiv. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says Russia is trying to drive Ukrainian soldiers off the battlefield by forcing them to protect civilians. Finland and Sweden have taken another major step in the process of joining the NATO alliance. Today, the 30 NATO allies signed an accession protocol for the two Nordic countries. That process will go into effect once the Swedish and Finnish parliaments ratify the decision and is expected to take up to a year. Finland and Sweden's accession to NATO will mark one of the biggest shifts in European security in decades and further increase Russia's isolation in the wake of its invasion of Ukraine. Dubious distinctions for a couple of Canadian airlines coming up where they rank on reliability. If you aren't flying off on summer vacation, consider yourself lucky. Right now, many Canadian airports are a tangled mess of long lines, cancelled flights and lost luggage. After a long pandemic pause, the airline industry is struggling to keep up with demand. And as Ross Lord tells us, when it comes to performance, Canada's two largest carriers have fallen way behind their American counterparts. Pandemic restrictions have been relaxed, but airline passengers are more tense than ever. Flights are routinely delayed or cancelled. Our flight today is delayed an hour so far. I flew from Denver on Air Canada here with a connecting flight to Lisbon. Air Canada decided at the last, and while we were mid-air, that they were going to give our seats away, bump us. I got delayed uh, three times, then they cancelled it. I'm kind of surprised the way it just kind of kept rolling for no explanation as to why. On top of widespread delays and luggage chaos, there's troubling new evidence about how unreliable Canada's two main carriers have become. It's based on monthly information gathered by the analytics company Sirium. Sirium's on-time performance metrics for the 30-day period ending July 3rd show American carriers Delta and Alaska Airlines top the list at more than 80% reliable. At the bottom of the list, Air Canada flights arriving as scheduled just 38% of the time, the worst of 10 large North American carriers. WestJet was not much better, arriving on time only 54% of the time. Some analysts say there's been a lack of strategic planning. Governments, uh, departments, and uh, the airports and the airlines were flying ironically by the seat of their pants in an industry that requires tremendous coordination, always has. The advocacy group Air Passenger Rights says it's being swamped with complaints, placing the blame squarely on the airlines. So now instead of overselling individual flights, they're overselling the network capacity by scheduling more flights than, than, the, than, the, than the facilities, the infrastructure can handle. In an email statement, Air Canada says it's working with all of its partners to improve the industry's performance. The WestJet statement says the airline has stabilized its operations but apologizes for the industry collectively falling short. Plenty of work to do before air travel in Canada truly takes flight again. Ross Lord, Global News. Contending with a lengthy heat wave and subsequent drought, Italy has declared a state of emergency. It will give the government extra funding and power to respond to scorching conditions and water shortages threatening the country. The focus will be on easing droughts in the country's north, including the Po River Valley, an area suffering its worst drought in 70 years, and which accounts for roughly a third of the country's agriculture production. Soaring temperatures were blamed for triggering a glacial landslide in the Italian Alps on Sunday. Five people remain missing after 48 hours, all identified as Italian climbers who were caught on the mountain during the avalanche. So far, seven people have been confirmed dead, another eight injured. 
A copy of one of the world's most famous paintings has been targeted by climate protesters. Our future is bleaker than ever. Protesters from the group Just Stop Oil glued themselves to a copy of Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper and spray painted the phrase no new oil below the artwork, shutting down a section of the Royal Academy of Arts in London in the group's latest demonstration against the use of fossil fuels. While in Connor Holmes, I tried to commit suicide three times. Ahead, what a teenager says he endured in a group home and how he's thriving now. You're watching Global National. While some consider their teenage years among the best in their life, for Liam Smith, they were the darkest. At 15, he was placed in Ontario's child welfare system, an experience so traumatizing he tried to take his own life. For much of that time, he lived at a group home operated by a company called Connor Homes, a private for-profit company that Global News, in partnership with APTN, has been investigating for months. What it's like inside the homes and how those kids are treated is often shrouded in secrecy. But tonight, we get Liam's story firsthand. Carolyn Jarvis reports. Liam Smith was only 13 when his mom died in a car accident. Smiles faded from photos, and grief turned to agony when he says his family turned on him. The two different family members I was with couldn't, didn't want to take care of me. And so he eventually arrived on the doorstep of a group home run by Connor Homes, a place his life would unravel even further. Everything was like scored out of one. Did you make your bed? Did you shower? Like when I'm depressed, I'm not showering. And when you're sick for, from school and you don't want to get up to eat, there goes half your points. When kids didn't score high enough, freedoms were clawed back. And a rare chance for Liam to see his half-brother was taken away. We were going to go to the Peterborough Zoo, got cancelled for having a bad mental health week. For Liam, finding a sense of family inside those walls was nearly impossible. Especially when, he says, the workers who were supposed to care for him would quit in a matter of days or weeks. We would bet like snacks and stuff over how long people would last. Because they left that frequently? Yeah, like every three months there would be almost like a whole new team. According to former workers, many staff were untrained to help kids with complex needs, which meant when Liam had a tough day, some didn't have the skills to help him. And too frequently, he says, he'd end up being physically restrained. They would like hold your, your wrists like, like this, on, like you were on the ground, and they would, somebody would hold your legs. Connor Holmes, which declined an on-camera interview, said group home staff receive regular training and every child receives wraparound supports from a multidisciplinary team, including therapists. Still for Liam, that wasn't enough. While in Connor Holmes, I tried to commit suicide three times. His mental health, which he says was fine before his mom passed, began to plummet. It felt like you weren't worth anything. There was just nothing, nothing ever to do. You're so bored. It's like, I don't even want to wait these three years till I'm out of care. Like, I'd rather just go now. After nearly two years at Connor Homes, Liam moved to a group home run by a different company, where he stayed until he was 18. Today, he is a success story. He lives independently and has a job. But that success was built mostly alone and in the memory of what love once felt like. It takes a village to raise a child, but I don't think there was a village there for us. Carolyn Jarvis, Global News, Toronto. Game changer. Next, the new NHL GM making history twice. Haley Wickenheiser has a new role with the Toronto Maple Leafs, assistant general manager. The Hockey Hall of Famer and four-time Olympic gold medalist has been working in player development for the Leafs since 2018. She'll continue in that department as assistant GM, the fourth woman to be promoted to that role in the NHL. The San Jose Sharks have broken one of the few remaining color barriers in professional sports, naming Mike Greer as the first black general manager in NHL history. While Greer's hiring is being hailed as an historic first, as Mike Jolet reports, it comes decades after black athletes in other leagues rose to the front office. Hi, Sharks fans. It's Mike Greer. I'm your new GM. And with that, history has been made. 
And yes, Mike Greer says he's proud to be named the first black GM in NHL history, but he says it's what he does with it that will define his cultural impact. My job is to do the best I can for the San Jose Sharks organization, and if I do that, hopefully it opens the door to, to give other opportunities to other minorities to, to get in front of office positions and, and maybe lead a team down the road as well. It's a road he hopes has fewer bumps than the ones paved by men like Willie O'Ree, the first black man to play in the NHL, and Herb Carnegie, who had a tryout in the NHL a decade before O'Ree, but was denied the opportunity to play. This week, it was announced Carnegie would be inducted into the Hall of Fame as a builder for a life spent trying to make sport more inclusive. It turned out that he was the one black man that was always the first in, in different aspects of his life to do things. And so he has a long list of, he was the first. Um, and you would think that when you, you know, here we are 80 years, 100 years later, and we're still saying that we have to say this is the first. Every sport has had its pioneers. Wayne Embry became the first black GM in the NBA in 1972. Bob Watson followed in baseball in 1993. Ozzie Newsome in the NFL in 2002. And now in 2022, Mike Greer in the NHL. And this is actually Greer's second first. He was the first African-American player born and trained in the U.S. to make the NHL. Eastwood shoots it and deflected. Women's hockey is also embracing progress. The Toronto Six franchise was recently purchased by a minority group of partners that includes Bernice Carnegie. We are the first BIPOC owners of a uh, professional hockey team for women. Barriers are being broken down. Sport and society in general are better for it. Microlight Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Tuesday night. I'm Colleen Christie. Tonight's Your Canada is the Norse settlement at the Lanzo Meadows historic site in Hay Cove, Newfoundland and Labrador. We love seeing Your Canada. Please email your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you back here tomorrow. Good night.